Hi, this is Mike Spivey of the Spivey Consulting Group. I'm going to give you the time of day, actually. It's 5.30 a.m., Wednesday, November 11th. I just finished a run. There's two reasons I'm giving you the time of day and the run variable. I'll come back to that at the very end. This podcast is on self-care, the fallacy of reductionism, and something to be said about an N of one. Incidentally, never use that sentence in a personal statement (laughs) because we often talk about not making your personal statements overwrought. But this is a podcast I've been wanting to do for years. So why have I been wanting to do this for years and maybe equally importantly, why have I put it off? I put it off because in almost all of our literature, our blogs, our articles, our podcasts, we focus on... I would almost call it the medicine practice, the clinical practice of admissions versus the math of admissions. And what I mean by that is admissions is not math. You can never, ever take two plus two and equals four. And what I mean by that is you can't give me your application and I can't tell you, no one can, that you're going to get into these 20 of 20 schools or these 18 of 24 schools. Important point to remember because this is going to bring me to the fallacy of reductionism. What we try to focus on our podcast is the sort of medicine approach to admissions, which is okay, you know, going into the process, you have a 40% chance at the school. Let's turn it into 55% chance. So we can't take 40% and make it 100%. In fact, when we get those inquiry calls, we always politely say, you know, we can't do that for you. Or, you know, if you're at the 99% chance, so in the medical analogy, if you're, you know, the fittest person on the planet and you come to us to be your personal trainer, we're not going to take you either because you're already there. This podcast is not on increasing those percentages. It's on how people decrease their percentages by trying to reduce every component variable and how in the self-care world, that doesn't work out so well. So again, the fallacy of reductionism. When I started admissions, I think there was one book in the bookstore. It was written by this guy, incidentally, with no admissions experience. And he just quoted a bunch of deans of admissions and put them in these like little square excerpts. Keep in mind, every school is looking for different things too. So the book wasn't helpful at all. And then he just wrote about his business school experience. Mercifully, I haven't seen that book in a while. Now there are literally, and I was playing around with this last night, thousands and thousands of blogs and podcasts on admissions advice. That's just from people who claim to be experts. If you start adding in all the people who just had a good cycle and start giving good admissions advice, it's almost unlimited. There are unlimited amounts of information out there, and you can get down to variables that are so ridiculously nuanced that unfortunately, some people think yielded the outcomes of the applicant. So applicant says, hey, I have a 3.5, a 169, and I was just admitted to UVA. And people say, well, you know, wow, I want to replicate that. What did you do? Well, I visited three times. I spoke to the dean of admissions once on the phone. I play the saxophone, et cetera, et cetera. And you could go on. I have phone calls the last three hours about these topics. The problem is that I think because there's so much information, and incidentally, a lot of it is just horrendous, people who apply to law schools, people we interact with, the people who visit our firm's blog and our podcast are really smart, problem-solving people. So they say, okay, admissions is a problem that I can solve. So if I just find all, again, mathematics, if I find out every variable and plug it into the equation, I don't think they say this consciously, I will get all positive results. Let me give you a story about how untrue this probably is. Many years ago, my business partner, Karen, and I, we shared a client. So Karen was the director of admissions at Harvard Law School for 12 years, and she had joined me. It was her first year, so we did some joint clients. We had one client who I I can remember where I was when I called her and said, you know, you applied to 12 schools and they're all in the top 20, you know, somewhere in the top 10. And I know your data, I know your application, I know the cycles data. So you're just going to get a lot of wait lists. So just brace yourself. And I can remember, you know, where I was standing, I was standing behind a target. I was going to go in there and buy my three typical five hour energies of the day to get me through the day. But I I felt the need to let her know it was going to be a long cycle before I started my day because I knew she had just submitted. Long story, slightly shorter. So she gets into something like 11 of the 12 schools right off the bat. Incidentally, by right off the bat, I don't mean like that week. I just mean that she wasn't waitlisted. She was admitted, straight up admitted to 11 of the 12 schools. 
So we were fascinated because it's not the outcome we predicted. And between the two of us, Karen and I, we have about 40 years of missions experience. So, you know, we're pretty good often at predicting outcomes. So we went back in there and we read her application and we read it again. To this day, I cannot tell you why she went 11 of 12. I know she had a differentiated and kind of clever personal statement. I know she had some good softs. But I personally, nor can anyone at my firm, reduce every component variable that would yield the results that she had. So that would be, again, the fallacy of reductionism because we try, man. When, when people have home run results, we go in there and we try to figure out, you know, can we replicate, obviously not the exact wording, but can we replicate the strategy? There's a scientist I'm quite fond of. He's a longevity expert and I would rather live longer than shorter. His name is David Sinclair. I remember him saying once in one of his podcasts, we hardly know how one atom interacts with another atom. So science is very tough. My point is this. In emissions, sometimes we don't know why one variable that's minor bounces off another variable that's minor that creates sort of a synergistic effect that causes someone, and this is all you want to do, is get more eyes on your file more often. If they're not interested in you, they're not taking the time to pull your application file. So there's probably 15 or 20 variables that we know as a firm will get people to look at your file. And we did a blog on that. So rather than me just taking up time on this podcast, we will link that blog and you can look at what those 15, 20 variables are. There's probably a thousand variables that also at any given day may or probably may not hit that dean of admission on that day. I I remember one of my first jobs in admission, my boss was super data centric particularly very data centric early in the cycle. And all that means is, you know, we would find candidates that we adored late cycle below our medians and admit them. But early cycle, generally it was people that helped our medians. So one day, very beginning of the cycle, I see that we admitted someone with an LSAT well below our median. And it wasn't the phenotypic of what we would do in admissions at the time, at that time of year. So I got intrigued and I pulled that person's file Turned out they had one line on their resume. It was a powerful line. They were a former Olympic skier. And what did my boss who admitted them have a huge passion in life for? Skiing. Again, you know, you can't replicate that data point. You can't just start putting things in resumes that hopefully the dean of admission has a passion for. But the right variable bounced off the other right variable at the right time. Which is going to now sort of get me to the end of one part of this which also gets me to the self-care. You are an N of one, and there's never in science, math, anything, including admissions, particularly including admissions, because I hate these predicting websites. We could put one up on my firm and get a lot of traffic, and we have a lot more data than I think the ones that are out there. But it's misleading traffic because it doesn't capture anything, but this was my LSAT, this was my score, and this is the school I got into. But does that capture my friend, Justin Ishbia? Again, I love using him as an example because I have carte blanche permission to use his name. He applied non-URM 152 LSAT to Vanderbilt when I was at Vanderbilt. He was the last person admitted off the wait list. We admitted him either you know two days before orientation or the day before orientation or quite possibly even the morning of orientation. And there's nothing possible in a predictor that would explain why we admitted him. To this day, I'm not even sure I could explain why I admitted him that day. I just always remembered his visit and the sincerity of which he addressed his LSAT score and his career ambitions. And there was nothing phony about it. And all cycle long, I had him in the back of my head. But again, these aren't variables you could ever figure out online and say, oh, I saw someone with a 152 non-URM admitted at Vanderbilt. You know, I bet you their special interest, he was not. You know, or I bet you there was something in there amazing, and there wasn't. It was just a sincere conversation one day. Again, two variables hitting each other at the right time, at the right moment. And he was an N of one, a sample size of one, because he stood out, but you couldn't replicate how he stood out. So now let me get to self-care, because I'm already going a little bit too long. The self-care that I'm getting at is I see more and more every cycle. And this is a tough cycle, inarguably. The problematic part is more than ever before, people look at other people's results. And it's almost always going to seem like this. 
Oh my goodness, look at these waves of admits. All these people are getting admitted and I haven't heard from my school. Except so many other people, trust me, because they're sending me direct messages, emails, Twitter messages, etc. Or you just see it on, on, online. So many other people are having that exact same thought too. I submitted my applications in September and it's December and I haven't heard from a single school. So I must be doomed. That is the fallacy of reductionism because you're, you're trying to see why all these other people got in and you're not looking at yourself as an N of one. I can't tell you how many times over the last six, seven, eight, nine years, people who haven't heard in September, haven't heard in October, haven't heard in November, haven't heard in December, and next thing you know, they get this wave of January admits. I'm horrible at timing, by the way. Predicting, I'm generally pretty good at predicting whether someone will get into a school eventually or not. Horrible at timing because, again, there's just variables bouncing around that admissions office that you don't know of. So self-care, what can you do? Number one, I wish people would get away from these prediction websites. Unless ETS and LSSE were to take every single data point and put them in a matrix, which incidentally would still defy the understatement of the end of one, you're really looking at a tiny self-selecting fraction of the applicant pool that's giving you almost no good information and stressing you out. So the first thing you should do is get away, I think, from as much as you can from prediction modeling. The second thing is, and I'll link this blog. I have a motivational blog too called Spivey Blog. And there's one I wrote on load management day because I found myself too stressed out by constantly being on social media, constantly getting messages, constantly having to read you know stories about myself online. So I give myself what's called a load management day where I literally delete every device from my phone that connects me to the social media world. Obviously, I don't delete my phone because I have to be on the grid. But I don't check things for a day. If you could give yourself two load management days a week, your cycle would be much less stressful. And believe it or not, you probably might even at the margins have better results because you're not trying to do all this emulation stuff. January, February, March, April, when you're seeing people get off the wait list and you're trying to emulate them by just spamming schools with phone calls. That's a podcast for a different day. I mentioned the time of morning that I just ran, not so much because I'm super proud it's 5.30 a.m. or I'm super proud that I ran, but what helps me is routine. So when I get up really early and I get exercise in really early and then I get my most stressful work assignments done really early, that routine is very good for my self-care. Having things to get me away from work. I, I won't give myself an example. I'm not going to talk about like you know things I do for fun, which are really boring, reading and writing. My COO, Anna Hicks, who I probably call eight times a day, she plays Dungeons & Dragons. She might <laughs> edit this part out of the podcast. She plays Dungeons & Dragons, I don't know, twice a week, maybe. I actually don't know. She doesn't often like just tell me when she's playing, but I try to figure it out in my head so that I won't call her during that three-hour period because everyone needs to get away. Look, if you go work in a big law, mid-law, a company, the demands placed on you are going to be so enormous time-wise. Hopefully, you'll think back to this podcast and you'll say, I remember that guy saying that. And now I know why when I send him a direct message, I usually only get a two-sentence reply because he's getting 300 a day. That's going to be your life. So don't make it your life now. That's another sort of self-care part. You don't have to be on the grid. Someone checked their Georgetown status checker, this was years ago, like 1,500 times in one day. And then some other applicant figured out how many seconds that was per waking minute. You know, it was like every 47 seconds they were checking their Georgetown status checker, which incidentally schools can see that. Getting away, having hobbies. You know, I'll let you pick your hobbies, of course. So this is none of my business. I'm going to mention one more thing. You can also embrace the stress, oddly as that sounds. There's an author, Kelly McGonigal, who I'm sort of very remotely connected with. Somehow we became friends on Facebook. And once a year, usually it's me, I'll send her a message and I'll say, how did you finish your three books? I'm still stuck on book number one. And, you know, she'll give me a little bit of advice. She wrote a wonderful book I highly recommend. I rarely recommend books to law students because of the amount of reading you're going to have to do. It's called The Upside of Stress. Stress is not always our enemy, particularly when you can make a challenge an opportunity and learn from it. And this book is wonderfully about that. What is the law school admissions process if not a challenge? And if it seems challenging now, just wait till this summer when you're on wait lists.
There's going to be stress. There's going to be challenge. You can embrace it in the right kind of way. Again, I would recommend that book, The Upside of Stress by Kelly McGonigal. Disclaimer, I get zero, you know, kickback or royalties from it. I mean, she has no idea I'm even mentioning this. It was just a book that I read that I really appreciated. I hope this was helpful. It was longer than I thought it would be, and I hope it makes sense. Again, generally our podcasts are do this variable, do this variable, and we'll link that. I'm going to link the load management one, and I'm going to link the one on the variables that matter the most. And if you do these things, it'll increase your chances. What I'm trying to talk about now are the people that get so, understandably so, so into the admissions process that they decrease their chances by trying to capture a hold of variables that we're not even sure on any given day are, are really impactful or not. Self-care, the fallacy of reductionism, and honest to goodness, there is something to be said for an end of one. This was Mike Spivey at the Spivey Consulting Group. 